All right, guys, let's see if that works. All right, so thanks for Graham for letting me do this today. I appreciate it. Thanks for everyone who came from the web development uh, module. You guys are very welcome. Uh, so we're going to do a little introduction on cybersecurity tonight. Now, I don't know what the level is in the room. Some people may have some experience with it, some may not. I try to keep this a mix between being basic enough for everyone to understand, but some technical stuff that you guys aren't bored. So if there's any questions, let me know uh, near the end, and I'll try to cover them the best I can. So the uh, first thing is, what is cybersecurity? So cybersecurity, that's the definition that I pulled from Wikipedia. But basically, it's the working together of people, uh, technology, and uh, strategies to kind of uh, detect detect and protect against the growing threat of cybercrime and um, hacking throughout throughout the world in an industrial sense. So there's many different areas for it. It's a huge, broad, broad, broad uh, spectrum all across from uh, forensics to vulnerability analysts to uh, offensive, uh, offensive pen testing. The list goes on and on. So we're just going to kind of keep it more from my background, which is vulnerability and uh, exploitation. So ethical hacking, uh, some people think that's a misnomer. It's Kind of is. Uh, we refer to it in the business as red teaming. So there's blue teaming and red teaming. Red teaming would be uh, actively trying to get into the network and using the same tools and techniques that um, hackers would use. And then you would report and explain your findings to try and hopefully get it fixed. So what we're going to see here is what's actually used in the real world and what red teams would actually be doing. So cybersecurity, it's a, a grown market. It's like so many cybersecurity jobs in Ireland now at this point, it's ridiculous. And all across the world, um, you can see here just the numbers. Five main, uh, main attack types, zero days, cloud data leaks, mobile malware, target attacks, and SQL injections. SQL injections are huge, huge problems, as Graham knows. <laughs> uh, the top five areas for protection, the network defense, endpoint, data in motion, data arrest, and uh, analysis and correlation tools. Network defense would be obviously attacking the networks. So hackers get in, they have control of your network, you want to try and stop that and mitigate any risk that would be um, causing it. Endpoint, most people in this room probably have some form of, some form of antivirus on their computer. That's what endpoint security is. Data in motion would be how data is transferred back and forward. You want to try and encrypt that using certs or you know VPNs or whatever. Data arrest would be your data centers, uh, cloud storage, all that kind of stuff. Um, analysis and correlation tools are pretty much, they're what analyze the data. If they get hit, everything leaks. So they're the five major areas that are uh, top, of the, top of the chain right now. Super important and it's only gonna get bigger and you'll see why. Oh, also, Speaking of which, there is a huge gap in the market, so now's the time to get into cybersecurity because nobody wants to deal for some reason. So feel free. <laughs> so uh, types of cybercrime, again, keeping it really basic, but this is uh, more of an overview than anything else. Hacking, uh, denial of service attack, or DDoS attack, uh, sorry, uh, DOS attack, uh, virus dissemination, computer vandalism, cyber terrorism, and software piracy. Okay. And here's how they break down by percentage. So financial fraud, only at 11%, sabotage of data network, 17%, theft, 20 system penetration from the outside, 25%, denial of service, 27%, unauthorized access by insiders, 71%, employees abuse, abuse of internet privileges, 79%, and viruses, 85%. Those last three are the huge problem in business and with hacking. It's very hard to break in from the outside it's always, you're, no matter how good your defense is, it's always undercut by somebody on the inside. Either, sorry, go on, Graham. Sorry, Gary, just a very quick question. Does the employee abuse of internet privileges, is that employees maybe accessing stuff on the internet and they don't know they go into the hole or something? Or no, it would be people searching on Facebook or you know, going to websites, oh cool, I got this link from my mate, clicking on it and... So they're not necessarily aware of it. No, no, and, and a lot, we see a lot, I'll get into more of this with uh, phishing, this is how phishing works. Someone's on, on the internet, they get an email, they go off and click it. Instead of having lockdown policies to deal with this, it just opens it up. And now one of the main things that you'll see, particularly with uh, security policies in companies, that they will set these policies up for this specific reason to kind of lock down this. And on the employees abuse for internet privileges, 
How many people in the room have bring your own device in their offices? Anyone can bring your own tablets or phone? Yeah. In, in the business, that's called bring your own debt because, <laughs> because they, they're not controlled devices. So that's something else that will contribute to that. But I want you guys to bear in mind those last three, super important. Change of face of cybercrime. So on the left is a cute little image from the movie Hackers. Big fan of Hackers, it's great. Uh, it's terrible, but it's great. And you know, that's why everybody thinks hacking is all kind of weird gooeys and stuff, it's not. Um, but some viruses were like that back in the 90s. And now it's kind of moved on to state-sponsored uh, cyber war, basically. And now these viruses get out and impact in a very real way. On the right-hand side, this is how Stuxnet works. Stuxnet was the very first, very first cyber weapon, really. Um, it was a, uh, an attack done by, more than likely, America um, to disrupt Iran's uranium enrichment program. And it's, been, it's known as the most advanced virus ever written. It was distributed to a USB, plugged in, and then went in and hit the network. Now, it's, what's interesting about it was, it was designed to do one thing, look for a very, very specific type of um, like spinning rod that would enrich the uranium, make it spin up really, 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 really fast, and then explode. Like, it's actually incredible how much work was, was done in this. This was actually picked up by the lads in Symantec in Dublin. So it's a very, very Irish uh, virus that was discovered here. And there's some great movies called uh, Zero Day and stuff like that where you can actually watch the development of this. But we went from that to this in about six years. It's crazy. Now after post 9-11, we have state-sponsored hacking. The Zero Day market is incredible and everybody knows about the dark web or if you don't, you're about to find out about it. So Fault 7 and Cyber War, this is, this is thanks to Obama, and this came out uh, with, with WikiLeaks. So Vault 7 is a series of documents that um, was published in 2007, and it outlines pretty much the entire CAA uh, hacking arsenal, or the Cyber Warfare Division. Um, it outlined stuff that was branded a conspiracy theory up until this point how to hack smart TVs, how to exploit Linux systems, how to exploit Windows systems, you name it, it was there. What's crazy about this is not only were the documents released, but you can actually go on GitHub and get the tools because Anonymous hacked the dark web option and got all the tools for free. How we found out about this was, um, this was like standard issue to the CIA and one of the toolkits went missing. Ended up on the dark web and now we have them and I have them on a USB key at home. <laughs> that I got from GitHub. So it was that easy. So here's some of the stuff that came from, from WikiLeaks. Uh, had an SP, like it actually gave legitimacy to the claims that the CIA had an, S, an espionage in this, uh, division. They were secretly hacking pretty much everything. Uh, they, Obama built the most powerful cyber attack arsenal, costing the taxpayers over 100 billion. Lost it all to the enemy for free, and then Anonymous hacked it. Uh, like the list goes on and on and on. It's absolutely crazy. The long and short of this is your smart TV is unsecure. All electronics can be monitored. Every Windows PC in the world could be infected with spyware and there's backdoors and everything. All Skype calls are being recorded. It's bad. It's really bad. Now how this affected us was we got the eternal blue exploit. Now this is, we're going to see a lot of this stuff. This is called a shell. It's like the command prompt that we have with Linux, but um, it's true Kali Linux or this is Kali, but you can use any kind of um, hacking tool to really get into it. And the goal is to use the Metasploitable console to get a shell. So you hack, that's what's called getting into a computer system. The Eternal Blue exploit was a Windows Zero Day. Now, Zero Day is a, an exploit that nobody was aware of, so it couldn't be patched. So there's zero days from it being patched. That's what it means. And this was the most powerful one. To this day, this is still you know, the first thing. If I was going to try to hack a Windows system, I would do this just because it would probably work. Um, particularly the more in corporate systems, people don't patch. Um, and this is the start of it. So you run it, you set your targets, you set the host. L host means uh, target host, or host means uh, receiver host, and then show operations and then run it. Boom, and you're in. All the updates in the PCs are patching all the backdoors or all that. Supposed to, but they don't. 
because what happens is when you're actually I'll get into this but when you're when you're blue teaming there is an order of patching there's an order of severities so you're supposed to do this but you know it only takes one system to go down from this and then you're in the network so you know you really have to have a proactive protocol and procedure to patch for this because it is something that is very very vulnerable but also on a on a private system you know people are people are still using this and how it actually impacted us really bad was WannaCry. This was the first time that we got to see an exploit being used in a very real way. How WannaCry works is solely pretty much because of this exploit it, and the Bertha ransomware. So what this was able to do was it, through the Eternal Blue exploit, it went in, was able to go into the network through Windows systems and just spread using, using um, what's known as a crypto worm. So it encrypts the files and then locks everything up. And the only reason why it spreads so much is because, again, people don't patch. So that's the screen you get. And I want to do something a bit different now and show you guys what it actually looks like in live time. So here we go. So this is a Windows 10 system. You get this uh, 1 encryptor and you click it. And once you click it, stuff starts happening. Boom, see that? So the screen changes and it throws up all this kind of stuff. And the only way you can actually uh, unencrypt it is to pay whatever the amount is in, um, in Bitcoin. And you know, from anyone who's, who I've talked to about it, they've actually, uh, apparently their tech support's really good. So you, <laughs> you ring them and they'll help you. You know, it actually gives you a very, a very good list of uh, what to do. So everything there is encrypted. Up the top is the one of the crypter uh, program that runs, and that's how you do it. And uh, yeah, the, the instructions apparently are really, really good. But that's the first real uh, impact of this uh, eternal blue exploit. So oh, let's go back to this. Now, how was it stopped? Well, this is interesting because it wasn't really stopped. It kind of comes back. Every now and then there's a new form of uh, ransomware or whatever, but how this specific one was stopped, um, it was actually through some lad who was working in, in, um, he was working in security, and uh, his name is Malware Tech, and follow him on Twitter. But here is uh, Wireshark, and it was run. So there was his local host, there was his local host, but it was sending off these these requests to uh, 224.0.0.24 is dot 252. He bought that domain. domain? Yeah, he, he bought the domain belonged to that IP and it killed it totally. That was the kill switch. Because inside the actual code, it constantly has to check this back and forward and all he did was bought it and that kind of killed it. So he was actually responsible for stopping the first um, outbreak of WannaCry. Now, they changed it obviously, but yeah. He was a hero for a while, then he got arrested. So, uh, right, so moving on a bit to uh, the sexy thing, which for some reason people have obsession about this. The dark web, so what is the dark web? Well, the dark web is pretty much anything that isn't indexed by Google, all right? Not to be confused with the deep web, uh, uh, sorry, the deep web is anything that's not indexed by Google. The dark web is where, all, where it's not really great things to be had there, but um, to get them unconfused by me doing it, but basically, the surface web is things like Google, Bing, Facebook, Wikipedia, anything that Google can search. The deep web is, you know, it's mainly just books, free uh, IRCs, uh, reports, all this kind of stuff, you know, torrent sites, blah, 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 blah. It's grand. Um, there's some interesting stuff that we had there, and it's about 90%. And then you go down a bit deeper, and you end up dark web. And to be honest with you, there's nothing good to be had there. So, But if you ever want to do it, you have to use a thing called Tor. Now, Tor is a... Is a Operating system, sorry, is a uh, routing protocol. And how the best way to do it is by using an operating system called Tails. Tails is known as the Amnesic uh, Live Operating System. So it's built on Debian. And the best way to do it is build it up on the USB key, pop it in, and you know it'll give you a screen just like this. Tor is built in, and then you can just search uh, through Onion sites and you know to your heart's content. But not only can you go search on uh, onion sites, you can also search the regular internet completely anonymous, for the most part, uh, because that's how Tails works, and how the onion router works. So we're Alice, and we're trying to get to that website, right? 
how the onion router works is goes around, goes to another node, and then down to the original node that we want to go. Well, Jay and Bob go directly to uh, the website. So that's how it works, like an onion. Constantly goes around and around, anonymizing traffic. If you ever want to do it yourself, you can just have your IP uh, or Wireshark or whatever going, and you'll see it changing in real time. It's, it's pretty cool, but uh, Tails comes in, and it's, it's, it's already built in, but you can even get like a, a Tor browser for your phone and stuff like that, so it's, it's, it's very, very easy to get online. But just be careful if you are going to go on uh, the deep web. So how does this affect me? This is, you're like, oh, Darren, this is very high-level stuff, but how does it affect me? Well, three big, th uh, four big things, but three things that you'll deal with on a regular, on regular basis. So the first one is botnets, right? Botnet is over here on the left. And basically what it is, the top left, basically what it is, is it's your computer being used as a slave machine to carry out whatever. Usually it's, uh, actually nowadays it's crypto mining, but beforehand it was DDoS attacks about four or five years ago. Um, so what happens is a bit of malware gets on your computer, it turns it into a control ser control machine and goes off to a command, command and control server, and that's what they're called. And then when they're active, they all go live and it all hell breaks loose. Over on the top, uh, the top right here is a bad USB. We'll talk about that in detail in a while. Over on the bottom left, uh, public Wi-Fi and phishing emails. Huge problem. Guarantee you guys deal with this on a daily basis. Uh, phishing emails, we'll talk about in a second. Public Wi-Fi, we'll also talk about. And DDoS attacks. DDoS attacks were very, very popular a couple of years ago. Uh, a lot of kids would do them. Use a thing program called the Ion Cannon which you get arrested for downloading, so don't do it. Um, but it's pretty much you're just sending requests at a web server until it crashes. And like, to be honest with you, that can have, if you guys ever try to buy tickets for like Metallica or something, when you sell you know, the website sometimes goes down, same thing, loads of requests, but this is just automated. It's actually a very, very easy tool to use. You just pop in and it works, and then you get arrested. <laughs> it's like magic. So there you go, the attacker goes into the bot, sends off the, the DNS request and just smashes that system. So that's how it works there on the bottom, <coughs> bottom right. Right, so bad USB attacks. So on the left-hand side, that is a basic script that you can pop onto a USB key, set it to auto-run, and it will turn off your system after about 50 seconds. That's it, that's all it does. But why it's dangerous is because by default, a lot of Windows systems are set to auto-run USB keys. Removable media is super easy to get around. Stuxnet was delivered that way, so it works super well. You can't really control it unless you do what IBM did, where you just banned it completely off the premises. Probably won't work, though, because people find a way around it. Again, people are a huge problem, always, with cybersecurity. And, uh, yeah, it's, we're going to get into great detail with this, but that's how easy a script is to write, to run on a USB key. Super effective. Phishing. So look, we have all worked in corporate offices before, or regular offices in general, and you get these emails. You know, hey, um, your password has been hacked, or your account's been hacked. You know, uh, click this link. So this is how we found out about the Podesta emails. He actually clicked an email like this, and we found out all the, the Hillary Clinton stuff. But how you can check these is you can literally just check on the headers. They're super easy to actually have a look at, but they're getting better and better. That's the only thing. But look, look up the top, from Amazon. Management at mamazoncanada.ca. Uh, if you just look at this, you can find it, and you can actually pick out the bits that this is this is not a real email address, or this is kind of dodgy. If you want to take it a bit further, if you hover over that link, it will take you to exactly where the website is. So, you know, it's very easy. But again, I've seen these happen in my own place where um, they'd be like, "Oh, there's a, the day before payday. There's a problem with your tax credits. There's a problem with your pay. Click this link." Sure, you click it even before you, you think about it, you know, and that's how it gets you. Another thing is social media sites. Now, you can actually do this in Cali. You can create and host your own fake phishing uh, front pages, host it on your local Apache server, run it on your Cali machine, wait in a Starbucks, sit there with your coffee, intercept the traffic, and wait for someone to log into Facebook. Boom, credentials, money. And that looks super legit except for the, the 10 dot address up top, but you know, this is designed to catch as many people as it can. You know, and if you intercept that traffic and it comes up on this, someone's trying to log into Facebook, oh my God, I've been logged out of Facebook, go back in, straight away, money. All right, so we're gonna talk a bit more about DDoS attacks, right? So this is 
this is kind of going into it there. Over on the left hand side is a basic setup for the anonymous toolkit, which in, which has a DDoS thing built into it. Um, denial of service attack is a cyber attack which the perpetrator seeks to make a machine or network resources unavailable to its intended users by making a temporary or indefinite disruption of services of a hosted content on the internet. So there's a DOS, which is denial of service attack, and a DDoS, which is a, direct, a distributed denial of service attack. Uh, distributed denial of service attacks is more common. And uh, the mo one of the most famous examples is uh, MyDoom, uh, which is a which is a, a tool to actually be able to use this in a real way. But uh, they really became famous with uh, Anonymous and their Operation Payback um, ops a couple of years ago. And that's pretty much how it works. The attacker sends off the commands to the slaves, hits the server, server goes down, and lulls are had. Right, public danger, Wi-Fi. Watch out for it, because it's, it's serious. So in your own public Wi-Fi, again, in Starbucks, uh, you can just throw up uh, Wireshark, have a little look around, see what's going on, and you'll be amazed what you'll see. Not that I've ever done that, but you know, or, or condone it, but you'll be amazed what you can see in theory um, when just by doing that, just by sniffing. Because people don't use VPNs. Uh, VPNs are super cheap. Um, NordVPN is quite good, actually, if, if you want a good one. Uh, I got this cool little graphic from ExpressVPN because it kind of sums it up perfectly. What a VPN basically does in a very low level or very high level, it, it, encrypts, it creates a tunnel which encrypts your traffic to the server, wherever it is, and then back again. So whatever you're sending, it's, it's relatively secure, so you can't really be spied on. Um, payments can't be seen. The ISP usually can't even see it. Um, what I would say, if you're ever using this to kind of keep yourself anonymous, just be aware that some, that some of them keep logs. So even they're not secure, but like NordVPN don't. So, you know, they're pretty cool. Sorry, Jared, does it have any impact on the speed of your connection? They shouldn't. No, like if you're, there's some free VPNs that kind of defeat the purpose of being a VPN and it can be quite slow. Uh, Tor, I use Tor as a VPN sometimes. That's pretty slow because it's a Tor network. But like Express, they're okay. Nord are super good. Um, on my own machine, I have Viper VPN. They're super good as well. It just depends. Like if you, you, you pay about two to five euros a month and there's no impact. So it's, it is worth looking into, particularly if you're on public Wi-Fi a lot. And you've got browsers like Opera that have a built-in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Opera is... Opera has a built in as well. That's pretty quick though as well. It's not it's not super bad like but it, like there are what's it? Opera have one as well. I think there's a few others that have them built in. But um there's an option on Edge. Yeah, there's oh yeah, but you wouldn't use Edge. Edge is terrible. Edge is great. Oh no. I I can't, I can't agree with you there, Mark. No. <laughs> um but no, yeah, Opera had them built in, and actually, a couple of years ago, believe it or not, Opera had one of the best free apps for your phone, and then they got rid of it. So if you want a free, good free, free VPN for your phone, Pornhub actually made one. It's gas. It's really good. It's called VPN Hub. I can't believe it. But uh, if you want a good free VPN for your phone, use that. But what I will say about free VPNs... Um, yeah, yeah, the, and there, there was one called... Um, Turbo VPN, and that's actually owned by China, and pretty much all the data is in China. They can read everything, so maybe you are sacrificing the, the private data to be on the network, yeah. but through the VPN, they can have all the access. Yeah, like it, the, if you, it depends what you're using it for, and I will say if you're using it to pay for stuff, buy a VPN, like buy, a, buy one, but if you're using it just to you know get around why, ads or whatever. Why don't you know. think there is Google has built in new, uh, new security measures, so HTTP website are not secure anymore. It's, it's, it's not the actual, it's not the actual website, it's the, the remember I said the data in transit? Okay. It's, it's the thing, it's the man in the middle attack that you're trying to watch out for. So the man in the middle, who has a man in the middle, I need to do an SSL transit, mm. I need to establish a connection point to point, client yep. and server. Yep. How can a man in the middle encrypt without my private key or the private key of the server have uh, access to this information? Why am I? Your, 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 is not secure. It is. It's. You're trying to catch it 
you're either trying to catch it by intercepting it using a fishing site or using some kind of uh, hun- it's called a honey pot. But uh, you know, the, as all I can say to you is, uh, firsthand when you see what people do online, they're not thinking that. They're just I want to see my Facebook photos now. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you know. It, so probably the same is now with the STD and the Facebook, the fake, the fake Facebook mm. with a tender, blah, 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 IP. Now, nowadays, if you try to open on Chrome, yeah. Chrome will pop up and say, this it is not secure. Yeah. Probably someone yeah. is. They've actually improved that now. Any non HTTPS site comes up with that warning. But again, you're assuming that everyone's using Google Chrome. You're assuming that people know what that is. And you're assuming that they're willing to wait. Okay. One thing you need to you need to why hacking works. People will sacrifice security if something is fast. That's how it works. And you'll see you see what I mean. Yeah, you'll see what I mean. So this is hacking in practice. This is from the Matrix, the Matrix Two, and it's uh, she's actually running a real Nmap command. Command Nmap is a. It's a network mapping device. You can use it to see what ports are open, all that kind of stuff. And it's the first place. It's the first thing you do in um, information gathering. So that will make sense down a bit. But I, I do think that's great. Like I love it so much. It's actually my phone background because I'm like, look at it. It's great. Also, it's a pretty handy command uh, if you if you're just looking for OS detection or. Uh, so what that command is basically doing is it's. It's a verbose setting, and it's looking, it's looking for OS identification. So it's, it's quite a handy if you, if you forget an MMAC command. You're like, oh, from the right. Uh, right, so hacking practice. So we're going to look at the live demo. What we're going to go into is we're going to look at Metasploitable. Metasploitable is an intentionally vulnerable Ubuntu server. I was going to do Windows, but my license ran out, and I'm like, I'm not going to pay money for it. So you know, we had to deal with Metasploitable. Uh, hacking is illegal. Always ask permission before hacking a target. Or create your own host, uh, lab in VirtualBox using the host only adapter. All right, so there's a basic lab for anyone who's interested. You know, anything that we've used with Brendan uh, would be good enough to run your own lab. Throw up a Kali Linux, it's free. Uh, you can get a free version of Windows 10, 7, and 8 as developer options, uh, and even Windows uh, Server as well. And then you can get a free version of Android as well if you want to try add some Android exploits. So, all right, there's a couple of different versions, uh, seven steps to do a successful uh, cyber attack. The most important is not firing commands in a hoodie with techno music playing. The, most, <laughs> the biggest one is actually reconnaissance, the first two, reconnaissance and scanning. So uh, information gathering. You have to figure out, right, which one is vulnerable, how are they vulnerable, how can I attack it, and which way is the most, uh, the most logical. So you do stuff like uh, you know phishing emails, uh, people used to do dumpster diving, uh, fake phone calls, whatever you need to do. Anything that's fit in the real world is called physical pen testing. So that that's kind of part of it too. That's Scott, like, uh, 90% of hacks, even more than that, 98% of hacks are physical pen testing. Yeah. So yeah. you've seen someone enter the password, you've read it, or you know, they've got the password under their desk. Uh, under the keyboard. So, yeah, yeah, they usually have, yeah, usually have, yeah. Okay. So there definitely is not this bit in the movies mm-hmm. where somebody's hammering away going, I'm nearly there. Yeah, and that, that, like, it never happens. Right. Like, it, it's ridiculous. It's actually, it's comical, but it's also scary how easy it is once you're in to actually do things. But like, uh, as Mark said, like, You'll walk by offices and you'll see people with a post on the saying password. Or hospitals. Hospitals are great too. You'll walk by hospitals, admin password. <laughs> okay. <laughs> secure password. Okay. Uh, I, I was helping someone secure a server one time. The guy was in India. I was like, enter your password in. Admin, admin. Oh, it's my secure password. Why? Oh, I use at symbol. All right. <laughs> sure, the Equifax hack that happened. That only like you can guess passwords usually because they you know information gathering there's list of most common passwords you can just Google it and admin admin is, is the single most common password for servers around the world That's the on the setup. and no one changes it. Most people don't change it no one changes it yeah 
Yep. You know, it's either four zero, so it's one, two, three, four. Yep. Nobody changes it. No. Nope. It's your initial lagging gauge for smart power. Mm -hmm. It's one, two, three, four. Yep. The ECU will accept it. Plain times out of ten, unless it has to be specifically changed by the owner. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like, and that's how the Equifax hack hack happened. In Poland, their servers were in Poland. They tried admin, admin, straight in, boom. These people spent millions on cybersecurity. No one told their server team to change passwords. <laughs> it's just unreal. So when you do your vulnerability stuff, uh, sorry, when you do your vulnerability setup, you then go into vulnerability scanning. So you'd use a tool like Nessus, which I'll show you guys at the end, uh, or Nmap whatever, and then it will show you, these are everything that's available, and then you start searching for exploits. So an exploit is, an exploit is a weakness. So it's either bad, poorly, code, poorly coded software, a missing patch, something that's been found, could be anything, but usually the most common one, and the oldest one is actually a thing called buffer overflow, Mark, which you, you know, you've talked to us about, where you create a thing, you create a line of code in memory, and then it's there and you can just exploit that and get into it. But all these exploits are all held within a database in Metasploitable, sorry, in Metasploit, and then you can just search them, use this one, and it will run, and you'll see how easy it is. Uh, after that, you're gonna try gain privilege. So if you're in the system, you're gonna try to get escalation. So the first thing you're gonna check is, where am I? So what kind of user am I? Oh, I'm a standard user, I'm Mary from accountant. Right, let's get up. So you'll try privilege escalation. You'll keep going as far as you can go. And if you can't go any further, you would then try to set up your own user hidden away or try to, uh, it's called extrastation. So you're trying to like stay within the network without being seen. Same with sustainment. So once you're in, you're going to try to carve out that network, that network and stay there for as long as you possibly can without being kicked out or being spotted. Like some hackers can be in the network for months, months at a time. And then they'll just be either pulling little bits of data or else waiting for it to get high enough privileges to be able to get in uh, further. Assault, um, this doesn't happen in everything. This is when they just hit something and stuff explodes, like in Stuxnet. So that's how they knew they were there because something literally blew up. Usually it's not. And obfuscation is hiding the tracks. So a lot of guys, um, a lot of lads actually, they like to show off, hey, look, I hacked this and they'll leave something in the system. And then they get arrested. So why women are really good ha hackers because they don't do that. It's weird, <laughs> but the lads do it, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's things you can do called uh, like using tools, log cleaners, spoofing, misinformation, zombie accounts, all this kind of stuff. Or you could just delete the whole thing and hope no one does forensics. But when they go through it, you can actually find this if you dig hard enough. But they're the, they're the seven steps that you usually take. So hacking and practice, these are, these are some big names. So Nmap. We've talked about that. Nessus is, uh, I'll show you guys Nessus now. Nessus is a corporate vulnerability tool, but can also be used for hacking. So look at my super secure password. Super secure password. All right, so this is what Nessus looks like. Uh, you know, this is on a, this is on, this is on, this is on a burner server. Um, so I just remote into it and you can just run your scans and it'll return a bunch of data and you know you can use that for your um, you can use that to patch and find vulnerabilities and all that kind of stuff so it's it's like a fancy end map basically it's, server, server. it's not on an Apache server it's on a CentOS server at the moment oh, okay. yeah now the next thing that, I, that that's here is Shodan Shodan is hackers Google Right. This is what it looks like. So, as Mark was saying, people don't change passwords. All right. People don't change default passwords. Who has ever changed their router password at home? That's less than half the room. Which means, if we were war driving, we could pull your passwords and get into your network, right? By just putting the admin password. I think the admin password for Sky is Sky One. Sky it is Sky One. Sky One. Yeah, an admin Sky One. All right. <coughs> So what this does is it compiles all these passwords to the point of when you get something like this, where it gives you, where you can just mess around and try to get into these. So it will give you the IP address, public IP address. It will usually spit out the password. It will tell you what kind of uh, protocols you're using and if the connection is open. 
and you can just search these and there's video after video after video of people online hacking into webcams, hacking into routers, turning stuff on and off again. It's crazy just because they can. So you don't want to end up on this, but now with IoT and stuff like this, you've seen a lot more of IoT devices. Um, so yeah, change your passwords on your routers, guys, seriously. All right, so we're gonna move into the hacking and practice. So this is the demo phase. So we're gonna be exploiting a vulnerable uh, Ubuntu server uh, using a known IRC vulnerability. An IRC is an internet chat relay. Um, it's like in the movies, actually, where you see the, the chats pop up and it's on, yeah. So what, what this can do is people can install it on their servers and it sends and receives messages from the server. So tools used, we're going to use Kali Linux. We're going to use Zenmap, which is a GUI version of Nmap. It's just easier to kind of show you guys. Uh, and then use Metasploit. The exploit used here is uh, CVE 2010, uh, 2075. It's an Unreal IRC backdoor command execution. So how we actually uh, define Expl uh, vulnerabilities is using the CVE database, so you can search those and pull what you want. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow us get in, run commands, and get into the system and gain a shell. So when you hack into a system, you're looking for a shell. You're looking to, to get in, and this is how you do it. So this was patched like eight years ago, in theory, but you know as you're going to see, when it's not, it's really bad. So here's one I prepared earlier. So here's me doing it from boot to root, basically. So this is, an, this is a ZenMap scan. So we're scanning this network, which is my local host network of uh, 192.168.48.0. So we're just kind of seeing what's going on. So you run the ping scan, see what responds, throws out these. Then you run a quick scan to get a bit more of a detail on exactly what's going on in the network. So we can see that on this machine, those ports are open. Okay, have a little look down, not loads of information, so we can dig a bit deeper. So we're gonna run a tenth scan, so this is really gonna start hammering the network a bit more now. And keep an eye on that OS host, there's something very interesting on the seat. Something very interesting just happened there, did anyone notice it? The, the, the generic computer logos changed to a Windows logo and a Linux logo. So there's two, so what's saying, what this is saying is, there's two Windows machines on this network and one Linux machine that I can identify. That, that, uh, that third one there, that's our Metasploitable box. So you can see that going through, okay, there's all the ports. If you ever see this on your network, you're gonna have a bad time. So there's an awful lot of uh, exploitable things there that you can just, you know, even without an exploit, you could probably try login, just using those ports, but we are going to kind of go into an exploit phase now, so I'll skip this a bit. So as you go on, you can go deeper and deeper and get more and more information. So let's see the hack happen. Right, so Kali command line, building up the, the, the Metasploitable console. So you enter in that command and it's going to throw it up now. A little bit slow, but that's okay. Yeah, there we go. So that's what it looks like when we open it up. So we, we give it Use exploit, set the host. So what, what we did there is, sorry, what we did there was we set the, the exploit that we're gonna use based on the, the its value in the uh, Metasploitable, um, the other Metasploit DB. And then we set the OR host, so that's our attack host. So the OR host is the remote host which we're gonna be using. And then we need to set the listening host, the L host, which is our Kali machine. Or sorry, you can show options here. It's gonna say you need a you need a listening host. So you pop in the listening host. Oh, you don't have to. There you go. It's, it's well, actually, it's already there, so you don't need to. So you just run it. Usually, though, with exploits, you have to set both. But in this case, you didn't have to. Um, with Windows host, you really do have to. Um, so what this is doing is now is it's just running. So that command can either be run or can be exploit and then it just runs through. So what it's doing is it's setting a reverse TCP handler 
from the host back and it's given a shell. So it's saying that it can't, uh, can't look up the host name, so it's trying to use the IP instead. Sending the backdoor command through the IRC backdoor, which is there on the system. And then when it finishes run through, look at that, that's beautiful. So we have a shell. Command shell session one opened. Okay. You have opened the port, 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 port. Yeah. And what is the, the is that no one port? Or well, is that see, what's happened here is this is the Kali machine. Yeah. So it was already set by we didn't have to set it, but usually we would. I was hoping it would, but I forgot I didn't do it. And then that's our attack machine there. So that's the port that we're attacking on. Okay. And it's giving you the time of day that was all done. So why this is kind of scary is because once we have this done, we can properly start messing around. So, or if the video plays, which it is. Yeah, so the thing about this is compared to a Windows host where it pop up and say, you know, C user or whatever. This you don't really know you have a shell until you read it. So you can kind of just be waiting for a while. But then once you get it, come on, there we go. Look at where am I? List the whole thing. Yeah. So list all the files that's there, and you can see the back to root. And then list what's on the root. And there you go. Scary, right? Yeah. Four, four commands, four commands between booting and rooting, and you have access to that machine. So it's not like the movies where techno music plays or anything like that. It's literally just you're already in. All the work was done because I knew what to look for, I knew what to hit, and I knew it would work. And from a security point of view, I mean, you know that there is a backdoor because there is a port open. You know, well, see, what you're, what you're doing there is you know it's an exploit. Right, so what you'd be doing is when you do your NMAP scan, NMAP scan, you want to see if that port's open. We knew it was open, so you could just try it. But to be honest with you, because this is so easy, and because it is so like patching is such a big problem, you could just try these. You could just sit there all day. I just picked an exploit out of random. I was like, that one, I know that one will work, and tried it, and it works straight away. You can just pick these at random. Yeah. It's not a good way to do it, but it is a way to do it. Um, the best way to do it would be obviously to be better at vulnerability uh, before you go in. So, just kind of moving on a bit. With Windows machines, um, when they're, you've got your machine on, so you're, you're Googling away. You've actually got another what, minimum of 20 ports or connections out that are open. You're not using them, or maybe Google is using one or two of them, or you're, system is getting small updates or sending small numbers to Microsoft or whatever. But those ports are there. So they're open. So the, the whole random bit of somebody sitting there and just going, ah, try it out, try it out, try it out. Nine times out of ten more. Yeah. And that's why I was that's why I was really uh, nobody opens task manager and looks at process and nope. goes to see what ports are open when all they want to do is get on Facebook. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, ordinary people are, you know, we're our own worst enemies when it comes to hacking. We are. Make it so easy. And that's what this is. That's what this is. Um, th this whole next section is talking just about that, Mark. Like, because the thing about it is, I really wanted to do a Windows one, but I just didn't have time. Uh, and I was the, the license ran out. But when you are, when you do start hitting Windows systems, you can see how easy it is. Purely by random, you know. Even try yourself. Just set up one, and then you, you will you will get in. <laughs> you, you, you will get in. You know, it's just it's it's just only a matter of time. So I decided. I was like, right, are we safe in CCT? This is an outside scan. Yes, server's pretty secure. Can't really get on the outside. Twenty five percent of works. Right? Can't really do it. The what? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I, I thought about it. How would I actually get in without cousin, without cousin hassle? Um, so I get in using social engineering. All right. So how social engineering works is you have the hook. You have so you have the investigation. You have the hook. You have the play, and you have the exit. Right. So you have to identify the victim. 
then how to get them in, uh, what you want the information to do, and then get out of there, right? So I'd use a bad USB attack, right? Why? Well, there's a great video from Black Hat in 2016. Black Hat is a big hacking convention in Vegas every year. And uh, they have a video called, uh, does dropping USBs in parking lots and other places really work? Yes, it does. So, and the more real you make it, the more legit people will be like, oh, I want to see what's on this, because it's... It, exactly, exactly. So here's the numbers, right? They dropped 297 keys. 290 were picked up. Keys that actually fell back were 130. Keys returned were 54. And people answering the survey that was there after it was 62. All right? But look at this. 35 hours after the initial drop, 80% of these keys were plugged in. 80%. People just couldn't, ha couldn't handle themselves. So they just said, oh, I want to see what's on it. <laughs> and that's what happened. Um, so how it works is just like with the last shell, um, so the last exploit, you're trying to get a shell again. So you're running the same thing, same exploit, blah, 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 same uh, tools using the exploit. Uh, you want to get a reverse TCP handler. And this all happens once it plugs in because you're just sitting there waiting on the listen, the listen host. You've got your session, you're in. That easy. That easy. So how this hack would work is you'd construct an exploitable software.exe file um, via MS Venom or something like that. MS Venom is in the MS console, and this is like, I couldn't be asked doing it myself, so this is something like full on it, but it's pretty, pretty easy again. You're just doing that uh, reverse TCP thing, that's what you want. You set it up as a, uh, as a, as a payload.exe file, call it whatever it wants, you know, a cool game or whatever. Someone will run it, or family pictures, or you know, you can hide, you can pretty much hide this in anything you want. And then exploit it in the session, uh, again, ex gain direct shell access there. Or else I just put a keylogger in and just wait for it to send back to me. And then log in as the fellow downstairs. And it work. It would work. So don't pick up USBs outside, guys. They did it in Dublin Airport. Uh, you know what? They actually did it at Black Hat a couple of years ago, where they gave out free USBs. Some lad took loads of them and then put them back. So yeah, it's it works. Hackers were hacked. Oh yeah, if you want to get hacked, go to Black Hat and bring your phone, or log on to, to Wi-Fi. So uh, there's a joke there, lads, if 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 you want. But uh, other than that, does anyone have any questions? So, in your opinion, what are the most best practices of the best practice in terms of increase the security of our endpoints, or not just the VPN? I mean. Upgrades or any other suggestions? Um, can increase our security? The best option is yeah, yeah. The, the, the best option is people. 